it is fantastic seeing so many people here. We were really worried about the march outside and that you weren't going to be with us today. I am going to talk with, to you about the conservation agreements approach that CI developed several years ago. But before getting there, I want to share with you a bit of my own experience in Northwest Ecuador. When I was about 21, I heard everyone talking about Northwest Ecuador with this high biodiversity and this area where it, where it rained all of the time. When I actually got there, the biodiversity was as amazing as they had told me. But what I also found was that there were a lot of indigenous communities and Afro-descendant communities that didn't have basic services, that have very poor education opportunities, and that there were no health services at all nearby. Nevertheless, here I found some of the happiest kids I've ever seen in my entire life. So that made me think that if I am really interested in conservation, we need to think about people, and conservation has to become beneficial for people. If you think what is going on around the world, actually most of the lands and waters are in the hands of indigenous communities and traditional landholders. What they want are the same opportunities as we have. Our job is to make that happen while they preserve their nature. Conservation agreements are win-win deals that allow communities to protect their natural resources that we all cherish as human beings, and at the same time receive benefits from that kind of protection. Basically, the conservation agreements have two main components. On one side, through a very respectful and transparent process with the communities, conservation actions are defined based on the threats to biodiversity. And examples of conservation actions around the world include communities committing to no poaching, no forest clearing, and to do patrolling activities. On the other side, we define together with the communities the benefit package, something that is going to be of interest to them and beneficial for them. We define these and we use the opportunity cost analysis as a reference because we want to make sure that we are supporting the communities as much as we can based on the effort that they are actually doing and recognizing how much they are losing when choosing conservation. Examples of benefits include social services, livelihood support, but also conservation wages. In addition to these two main components, we also define together with the communities what are the consequences of not complying with the agreement and how the monitoring is actually going to be carried out. I want to share with you a small example of how conservation agreements are actually being implemented in the Colombian Amazon. It is an area just in the border between Colombia and Brazil. And when we started working there eight years ago, the main issue was that these communities had these vast lands, however, and, and lakes, beautiful lakes. However, fishermen from Brazil and from their own communities were taking as much fish as possible, and it was becoming a food security issue. Communities were interested in protecting, but they didn't have the means to do so. After negotiations with the communities, a conservation agreement was agreed upon. Communities commit to not fishing these two main commercial species, to using only artisanal gear, and to do the patrolling activities of those lakes and surrounding forests on a permanent basis. On the other side, in this case, Conservation International in Colombia committed to provide patrolling wages for the people that were there for an entire month, equipment to do the patrolling activities, they also committed to support their natural resources committee, as well as providing additional funds so that the communities could decide how they can improve their communal lands and infrastructure. After eight years, that area and those communities are protecting more than 200,000 hectares of forest and the water bodies that are there, and the initiative is supporting more than 1,000 people, like a friend who is sitting there in the boat during the patrolling activities. We have seen that actually the fish population have increased greatly in the areas where the conservation agreements are under implementation. And when doing the analysis of deforestation, despite the entire, entire region having very low deforestation rates, deforestation in these communities is less than half of what is happening in other areas nearby. 
We believe that this model is the right for an area that is remote and territories that are managed by communities. And we have been lucky enough that the environmental authority in that part of the country is also looking at this as an alternative to re be replicated in other, in other areas. And it has been actually one of the main funders of this initiative. The example in Colombia is just one example of one conservation agreement. There are more than 4,000 conservation agreements at the moment that are in place. Some of them are between governments and communities. Others are between NGOs and communities. Of course, there are the others that are between governments, NGOs, communities, and other actors. But actually, the point is that these conservation agreements are crafted with the right stakeholders. And these are being implemented in 19 countries and helping protect 4 million hectares around the globe. The conservation agreements are not only being used to protect tropical forests. We are using them as well to protect rangelands in Africa, to protect mangroves, and to protect other types of semi-tropical forests around the world. The important thing of the conservation agreements model that we have developed is that it is systematic and it is teachable. It is not me or my team doing the conservation agreements around the world, but it is actually working in large partnerships to make this happen. This is our network of practitioners. They are actually the experts on conservation agreements. I have the honor to be their spokeswoman or ambassador or however do you want to call it. Uh, but these are the people that are with the map up to the waist working on conservation agreements around the world and sharing the same vision that community-led conservation is what is going to make conservation happen and remain around the world. Our goal is in the next five years to raise that and to have around 15 million hectares protected by communities under the conservation agreements model. We are planning to do this by expanding our current network of partners, by strengthening actually the sites we are working on and expanding those sites as well. Some of the key aspects that we are focusing on right now is training those partners, providing all of the support they need to have a strong conservation agreements. We are also focusing on brokering deals between donors interested in these kind of initiatives and the partners on the ground that are doing a lot of the work. And also thinking about quality control and monitoring to make sure that the agreements that we are supporting are reaching the goals that we want to achieve. I don't know if you have seen outside the roadmap booth, but following the roadmap, I think that the time to take action is now. And actually, indigenous peoples and traditional landholders, whether in lands or waters, are the strongest stewards of nature. It is time to make sure that we all recognize to their contribution to the entire humanity. So thank you very much for your time. Nice job, Margarita. Um, so the crowd here might not know that you were actually an incredible athlete and made a national team when you were still in high school, I think, right? So what sport did you play? Volleyball. Volleyball. Yeah, I had inside information about that. Um, so if you think of volleyball, given your experience, um, there's not a lot of win-win games in volleyball, right? And I'm really struck by how you talked about win-win agreements, and I just want to understand, like, if that's really true. Like, are there really not losers? Like, is this the one area where everybody wins? And if so, how do you actually make sure that they're fair? Well, actually, in the volleyball, yes, you might win a game against another team, but you actually have to cooperate within your team. True. If you don't work internally very well, you are never going to win. Right. Right? It is the same with the conservation agreements. It is about cooperating and figuring out a very straightforward process that goes from having a reality check whether conservation agreements can work in a setting, then going through a very respectful process of designing those conservation agreements with the partners that are on the ground and with the communities themselves. Not only with one group here or one group there, but following a process so that all of the voices of the communities are heard and the partners having the responsibility of making those voices heard in the discussions. Uh, in addition to that, it's having strong implementation and strong monitoring and thinking about the exit. For how long do we have to be in a site and when is going to be enough funding and enough capacity within the communities to manage those sites in the long term. Okay, so they are really win-win. Yes. Okay, so in order for them to be win-win, you just talked about um, 4,000 agreements yeah. in 19 countries. I'm walking you this way closer to the end. Um, 
tell us where does all that money come from? Like, <laughs> well, it has been a really interesting adventure. Of course, we started this, and we still have the support of the Mulago Foundation. Um, how I see this is that that initial support from Mulago allow us to test the conservation agreements in different settings and figure out what worked and what didn't work. The nice thing is that within CI and within the partner organizations we work with, they saw the results. So there was a time as a program that we didn't have as much funding to support others, but they kept doing these conservation agreements and raising funds from philanthropic donors, from bilateral cooperation and multilateral cooperation from, all, from, from the governments, actually. Okay. So there has been a wide spread of donors supporting these kind of initiatives. That's great. And then, um, you know, we've been talking about social entrepreneurs, which usually we think of as uh, founders of startups and early stage organizations. Um, you are at CI, one of the biggest environmental NGOs in the world. Uh, what's it like to be a social entrepreneur and trying to lead an innovative program within a big institution? I think it is very similar to being a social entrepreneur anywhere. You need to have a good product. You need to have local entrepreneurs that are willing to jump into the water with you. And you need to know that you cannot push anyone to do the things that you want, but they have to do them themselves, right? That has been one of the main lessons to us. And it is about partnerships, and it is about collaboration, and it is about showing results in conservation. And after 10 years of doing this, we have shown that, mm -hmm. right? So t tell me how, I mean, think about um, the big environmental NGOs, and I feel like we have to just acknowledge that there's a few organizations that in this sector have an incredible influence and play a really important role. Um, and we have to think about how to use the footprint and assets and expertise of those big NGOs and make sure that when there are innovations, like we heard about from Al or Leela, the big NGOs are actually able to maybe absorb them in some way. Not the institutions, but the ideas. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about. What do you think is the best way for smaller or local NGOs to engage with institutions like CI? That is a really tricky question, right? <laughs> um, reality is that depending on the NGOs, the NGOs are made of people. Right. And you will find <laughs> different kinds of people in different NGOs. Probably for the smaller organizations, they need to find the right partners within those NGOs. There is always a fear that large NGOs are going to steal the ideas and they are going to portray them as their own and they are not going to recognize others. But I know many people within CI and actually within other organizations that are more than willing to share and to make sure that others are portrayed and not themselves. Yeah. I think that conservation is a matter of perspective. We need to work together in order to save the world. If we are just thinking on ourselves, not going to happen. I think that's true too. And we're actually so lucky that it's not a competition. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're all working towards the same goal. And I think there needs to be a lot more sharing, like you're talking about. I know that you're interested in anyone anywhere doing conservation agreements. <laughs> I know. So okay. if you are doing conservation <laughs> agreements, please talk to me. I am sure I am going to be super interested. OK. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you very much. I'm going to shake your hand. <laughs>